the uh, title of the talk is uh, Deflexical Semantics. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, we'll see. Um, I want to start off motivating uh, this effort uh, by talking about the need for knowledge and you know, natural language understanding and then uh, go through several steps after that. So the key observation for me is that uh, we understand natural language discourse so well because we know so much. And so the big question in natural language processing is how do we use our knowledge to interpret uh, discourse? That breaks into two sub-questions. What is the common sense knowledge we have? And what are the procedures that use this knowledge to interpret discourse? And in this talk, I'm only going to uh, talk about the, uh, the first of these questions. Um, actually, if there are any of you that my, at my talk in Prague on Friday, I talked about the, uh, the second question there. Doesn't help those of you who weren't there. Um, <clears throat> Okay, first I want to distinguish between technical and everyday uh, vocabulary. Here's a, a passage from the business news section of, uh, of the uh, San Jose Mercury News. Um, and we see there's a number of uh, technical terms in there, like Silicon Valley and company, I guess, stock, and the name of a company, Media Vision Technology. Uh, but in fact, the everyday words in there used in their everyday ordinary senses uh, kind of overwhelm the number of technical terms there. So even in technical texts, 70 to 80 percent of the words are uh, everyday words used in their everyday senses. So the, uh, the question we have is, well, what regularities are there in the meanings of, of these everyday words that we can uh, capture? Um, now we could approach questions like this automatically or by manual methods. And uh, some interesting work has been done by uh, Patrick Pantel and a number of other people on, on the automatic discovery of uh, similar or associated words. So by the, the context in which they appear. So uh, using this, he discovers that Mary, the word Mary is very close to the, very closely related to the word wed and also to the word divorce. Now maybe you could turn these into um, axioms and logic, um, although it's, it's certainly non-trivial, but you might be able to get something like, uh, if, there, if there's a, uh, an event of, uh, oops, of, um, of X divorcing Y, then there must have been an event of X marrying Y uh, that happened before that. Um, but uh, one problem is that we, uh, this method does make mistakes. So, for example, the uh, system also discovers a close relation between married and murdered. Um, so, in general, the, uh, the, uh, the, these automatic methods yield high volume, uh, but middling accuracy and, and pretty low complexity. I mean, even, even this axiom would be hard to construct uh, automatically. Um, and when you get into more complex axioms of some of the sort that I'll show in a minute, uh, it's, it's rather daunting to think of how you might do it automatically. Um, manual construction of, axiom on the other, of axioms, on the other hand, is uh, high accuracy and high complexity, but necessarily low volume. Uh, so the idea is to uh, focus on the most common words. Now. Um, uh, Boyd Graber and uh, Feldbaum at uh, Princeton have identified the uh, top <coughs> 5,000 word senses in WordNet in the British National Corpus. Uh, and this now constitutes what they call core WordNet. And so I've been uh, focusing on, on uh, that particular set, set of, uh, of word senses. The, uh, the idea then in, uh, in what I'm calling deep lexical semantics is that you uh, have, whoops, you have the words, uh, you have underlying core theories of the phenomena that the words talk about, and you want to try to link these uh, with axioms uh, that will then thereby express the meanings. So you want to express the meanings of word senses as logical axioms in terms of predicates provided by uh, these underlying core theories. It's necessarily a manual task, and so we'll focus on the 
5,000 most common word sentences, and uh, that is the word net. So what we need to do is uh, first categorize the word sentences uh, that we have uh, into the various corresponding core theories, then construct these core theories and link the two with axioms. Um, <clears throat> here's an example, a fairly complex example of the word range, as in x ranges from y to z. So things like the, the tests on the, the scores on the test range from 33 to 96. So what does range mean? Well, it means if x ranges from y to z, there must be some, some scale, call it s, and some subscale of S, uh, S1 that the uh, scores lie along. Uh, y is the bottom of that subscale. Z is the top of the subscale. Uh, X is a set of elements uh, which has uh, one element at Y, one element at Z, and all the rest of the elements are at some place in uh, S1. So that's uh, the meaning of the word range. So what we've done is take this word range. We have an underlying core theory of uh, scales or scalar notions that tell us, uh, that explicate the concepts of scale, uh, the ordering relation, subscale, top, bottom, and an app relation. And then we construct axioms like this to link the, the uh, word with the underlying core theory. And then by, uh, all right, so this is a very abstract uh, definition of range, but by, oh, uh, let, me, let me just say on the, uh, with the scores exactly, if I know that the scores, the scores range from 33 to 96, and I've, uh, I've got this characterization of what range means, and already I can answer questions like, uh, did somebody get a 33 on the test? Yes. Did somebody get a 50 on the test? I don't know. Did somebody get a 15 on the test? No. All right, so there are some questions I can answer uh, knowing uh, this information right here. Um, and then by specializing the app predicate in this definition and specializing the scale in various ways, I can get the whole range of possible, possible meanings for the word range. So I can uh, get uh, the scores range from 33 to 96, or the timber wolf ranges from Mexico to the Arctic, or I've changed the scale now to kind of the north-south uh, scale in geography. Um, his behavior ranged from cheerful to sullen, where I, you know, now the scale is uh, something of, uh, of uh, you know, kinds of emotions one experiences, or the, the uh, kinds of attitude one takes. All right, so the next step then is to um, categorize the core word net senses into, uh, into uh, different categories corresponding to what the underlying uh, core theory would have to be. And then we'll look at some of the relevant core theories, particular composite events, scales, change, and causality, and then uh, look at how you go about defining words in terms of these uh, core theories. So, I'm not going to go through all of this, but just to give you an idea of the uh, categorization, there are words in core, word senses in core word net that involve uh, or talk about, uh, that talk about uh, composite entities or things made of other things, which is about the most basic idea you could have um, that would give us uh, that we would be relevant for defining words like empty and relative and secondary and similar and so on. There are scalar notions, partial orderings, and their structure that would uh, give us the material for defining words like step, degree, level, intensify, high, considerable, and so on. Events, uh, words involving change of state and causality, like constraint, generate, power. I'll get into these later. Uh, and then uh, spatial uh, words, uh, temporal uh, words about mental and emotional states and actions, cognition like imagine, horror, and so on. Communication or people communicating with each other. Uh, Microsocial uh, domain, social phenomena that, that would be present basically in, in small groups. So concepts like you know friendship, enemy, uh, help and cooperation, uh, conflict, leadership. 
authority, things of this sort. Um, and then uh, other, other categories would be geo and bio, materials, artifacts, food, and macro-social, which are concepts result or depending on a large-scale technological society, words like uh, architecture, airport, headquarters, prosecution. Um, so all the, all the uh, 5,000 WordNet uh, senses in, oops, in core WordNet uh, have been categorized and the, the aim for this categorization is to uh, get coherent clusters of words that can then be used to, to drive the development of uh, the theory. Uh, now I want to drill uh, one level deeper in, uh, in event words. Uh, what I mean by event words is words having to do with uh, change of state or causality. There's about 450 of them in one of the 5,000 core WordNet words. Um, so there's uh, words uh, having to do with uh, state, <coughs> meant to be in some state, like, uh, like uh, have, condition, contact, etc. Uh, words having to do with change, a real or metaphorical position, or a change in quantity, or change in possession, the beginning and end of the change, or the middle of the change, like path, variation, repetition. Um, there's words having to do with uh, causality, causing a change of state, uh, cause acting as a barrier, absence of causes or barriers, change in, uh, causing a change of position, like put, pull, deliver, etc. Causing a change in existence, develop, create, uh, causing a change in real or metaphorical possession, obtain or deprive. And then there's words having to do with instrumentality or intermediate causes, way, method, means, uh, processes, which are complexes of, uh, of uh, changes of state and causal relations. So the process as a whole, the middle of the process, a continuation, trend, etc. Opposition, force, and then uh, finally functionality. Uh, words relative to achieving the goal, like use, success, improve, relative to failing to achieve a goal, failure, blow, disaster, and relative to countering a failure to achieve a goal, like survivor, escape, fix, and reform. So, so the basic purpose of this, these categories and then the subcategories, is to uh, collect words into uh, coherent uh, categories, coherent groups, uh, and use those to drive the development of an underlying a coherent theory of the phenomena, in this case of kind of the structure of events, change of state and causality. A categorization like this is a big step toward an underlying theory. Um, I also have a similar thing with uh, uh, micro-social work that I want to uh, Go through that. All right, now I want to talk about some of the, uh, the most fundamental uh, relevant uh, core theories, in particular uh, composite entities, scales, change, and causality. Uh, now I'll go on to uh, define some uh, fairly common words in terms of these core theories. Um, a composite entity, as I said, it's a thing made of other things, and it's hard to think of anything that's more basic than that. Um, and a composite entity we define as a, uh, a set of components. Uh, those components have various properties. There can be relations among the components, giving them the structure of the entity. Uh, there are properties of the whole, and there are relations between the whole and the entities in its environment, including function. So we can get the granularity shifts uh, by, say, looking at the structure of something, and then uh, coarsening the granularity to think of the whole entity as a single in, uh, undecomposable entity and its relations with other things in the environment. Giving us, and then we can talk about the uh, structure function articulations which say, you know, the kind of unpack uh, the relations in the environment, the function, uh, in terms of the uh, internal structure of uh, the entity. Uh, so how are functional relations implemented in the uh, structure of the elements? Let me give an example. A, a book is a composite entity 
uh, its components are the pages, the covers, the binding, and the content. Uh, some of the uh, properties of the components are that the pages are made of paper. Um, relations among the uh, components are that the cover encloses the pages. The pages, uh, by a couple steps, uh, convey the uh, content. Uh, some general properties of book as a whole, well, it's a physical object roughly on the half order of magnitude of eight inches in linear dimension. Um, and some of the uh, relations between a book and its environment are that a person writes a book, uh, the function of a book is for a person to read it. And then uh, an example of the structure function articulation is, uh, well, where, where would you put the book? Well, if it's at home, the fact that it's a uh, physical object, uh, roughly eight inches in linear dimension, uh, tells you a shelf would be a good place to put it. Uh, if it's in a library, and you'll look at the uh, content, and if you see that's fiction, and the writer is uh, Larry McMurdy, then that tells you to put it in the M's. Um, in a bookstore, you might have a hardcover and paperbacks in uh, different parts of the uh, store, so that would be relevant to the functional uh, question of where you put the book. Um, now, uh, very important throughout all of the work uh, that I'm going to describe is, uh, is the figure-ground relation uh, viewed abstractly, which I represent just with the, uh, the predicate at. Uh, it relates an external entity to some element in a, a composite entity. So if I've got a composite structure like this, then I can take this external entity x and say, oh, it's at y. And then I can, for example, move it around Y and cause it to, to move around Y. And a lot of the most basic vocabulary um, in English or in other natural language uh, involves um, various instantiations of this app predicate. So the requirement uh, for the app relation is that all the elements of, of this system S have to be similar in the sense of sharing some property that allows a consistent interpretation of that. So I can say, uh, uh, say the pages of a book are sufficiently similar that I can say something like, John is at page 45. Um, but uh, something like the pages, the cover, and the content of the book, I can't, it's hard to think of a, uh, of a uh, consistent interpretation of the appellation. So I can't say John is at the cover. Either John is at the cover or John is at some bit of the content. Um, then we can um, uh, specialize or instantiate the app relation in a large number of ways. So one of them is spatial locations. So John Joan is at the back of the store. Uh, location on a scale, nuance closed at 58. Uh, membership in an organization, Joan is now at Google. Location in the text, the table is at the end of the article. Time of an event, at, at that moment, Joan stood up. Uh, event at an event, let's discuss that at lunch, where the event discussion is at the, the event lunch. Uh, and in general, at a predication, where you have a system of predicates, and you can say that this predicate in particular applies to this entity but by with an app relation, like she was at ease in his company. Um, so this provides a, a vocabulary of predicates for more specialized theories like spatial location and organizations and, and so on. So in general, word sentences are generated by a cross product of this topological structure that's given to you by composite entities in the figure ground relation and the specialization, the particular specialization of that and the main constraints on arguments. And uh, we'll see that. Uh, quite a few examples a little bit later. So the next core theory is one of scales, which is basically a set of elements with a partial ordering. And in terms of this, we can define subscale and total orderings and dense scales and the top and bottom and the reverse of a scale. Uh, James Allen's uh, relations among uh, temporal intervals are in fact relations among subscales. And then some examples of scales would be uh, distance, time. Well, these you have precise measures, but also just generally partially ordered scales like uh, qualitative scales like 
happiness, damage, and preference, uh, whether or not totally ordered. There's a number of levels of scale of the structure that you can impose on scales. Um, the simplest is to divide it into two regions. One is okay and the other is not okay. A lot of qualitative physics has uh, been done by uh, taking scalar notions and uh, collapsing them into three points, uh, plus, minus, and zero. So you, know, you care about whether the piston is going up, going down, or not moving at all. Uh, very common in language is uh, qualitative amounts, and I'll go into this a little later, in which we say there's a, well, I have a scale, and then I have the high region of it and the low region of it, and maybe a, a middle region as well. A lot of work has been done on uh, orders of magnitude reasoning. Uh, it seems to me that uh, a, another very uh, somewhat more fine-grained level of, uh, of uh, structure is uh, half orders of magnitude uh, that uh, play a, a real role in our life. When something gets uh, three times as big, it changes the way we interact with it. And then uh, to uh, more structured things like the integers and reals as you get in the measure kinds of qualities. So these qualitative uh, regions of a scale uh, provide a, a useful course during structure for the scale and they have some of the obvious uh, topological properties that the, for example, that the top of the high end of the scale is the top of the scale and that anything in the high end is bigger than anything in the low end. Um, these are the uh, Absolute form of adjectives can be defined in terms of these regions. Uh, so the tall is the high region of the height scale. And you can iterate it with uh, words like very. Um, the key facts about these qualitative regions uh, are that they should be related to functionality. I mean, generally, when we say that uh, something is large, well, we often mean that it's uh, large enough for something or too large for something. So uh, very often when you, you know, hear that something's in the high region of a scale, you want to uh, find out what, uh, what goals or what functions are being promoted or, uh, or not being, or being prevented uh, by means of this, uh, um, or because of this uh, uh, scalar uh, judgment. The other thing that you, um, I would like to know about the qualitative amounts is they should be related to uh, some as yet non-existent uh, common sense theory of distributions. So here's a, uh, here's a naive Gaussian, for example. Uh, we can, uh, we can uh, construct composite scales. Uh, so for example, damage is a uh, composite scale. There's, uh, you know, to, when you talk about severe damage, well, there's two things that uh, that could be referring to. It could be referring to the loss of functionality, or it could be refer referring to the uh, cost of the repair. So, you know, if a wire comes loose in my car, I might not be able to start the car. It won't run at all, so I've lost complete functionality. But it's cheap to repair. Uh, versus, uh, I get a dent in the bumper, let's say the engine gasket uh, starts leaking a little bit, then it's very expensive to repair, but it, not very much loss of functionality. Um, so you can uh, define it. So damage, for example, would be a, um, a composite scale consisting of uh, at least these two component scales. Uh, and then another important fact about it. So a lot of scales, like uh, happiness or difficulty, um, are impossible. I mean, they're, they're in general qualitative. They're, you can only, can only make qualitative judgments. You can't measure them. They're only partial orderings. They're not total orderings. So it seems like there's a, not a lot you can say about them to constrain what the scale is. But in fact, one thing you can often say about things is, is I mean, you can say there's a, a corresponding set of, um, uh, of entities or events. So for example, difficulty if you're going to measure the difficulty, then um, there's the things that kind of block your uh, block your way to achieving the goal. I mean, that's what difficulty is all about. Now, is it more difficult to get from here to Prague or more difficult to get from here to, um, I don't know, uh, Ostrava or someplace? Uh, well, 
Um, it's, that's hard to, hard to decide, but if we have a situation where every difficulty in achieving goal A is also present in achieving goal B, then we can say that uh, goal A is, more is at least as difficult, probably more difficult than achieving goal B. Uh, so this is uh, sub subset consistency, which gives us a kind of constraint on, uh, on very qualitative scales. Um, so the next core theory is, uh, is change of state. Uh, the basic predicate here is that uh, event or eventuality or state E1 changes into uh, event or eventuality E2. Um, it's not enough to say that, well, it's certainly true that if E1 changes into E2, and that's consistent with time. You don't change into a state that happened before. Um, but um, but you, can't, uh, you can't reverse it. You can't simply say that, for example, uh, there was a change from uh, Queen Elizabeth I being Queen of England to uh, the situation in which uh, John McCain is running for President of the United States. I mean, you might be able to tell a story about how these are connected, uh, but uh, in the absence of that story, you wouldn't say that there's a, a change of state there. Um, changes of state should involve a, uh, a uh, common entity. It's strange to say that there was a change from Anne being short to Joan being tall. Um, so there's a change of state is a change in the state of something. But they, uh, the D1 and E2 have to have somehow have the same participant. Um, and they should be uh, members of the same uh, kind of family of predicates in some sense. So it's strange to say that there was a change from X being red to X being tall. Um, and uh, some of the uh, two predicates that I'll use later are uh, a change from and a change to predicate, uh, where we just focus on the start state of the change or the end state of the change. Uh, the next uh, theory is uh, causality, and the idea here is to uh, distinguish between what I call the causal complex, which is everything that has to be true in order for the thing to happen, and the cause, which in a way is the most important. Um, so if I uh, flip a light switch, then the light comes on, and you say that my flipping the switch caused the light to come on. But in fact, there were a lot of other things that had to happen as well. So the, uh, the uh, light had to be intact, working, uh, the wiring had to be intact, the power had to be on in the city, and so on. Um, so all of these other things are in the causal complex, but we identify the flipping the switch as the one thing in the causal complex that is the, the cause. Um, so that in terms of uh, cause, we can also define related things like enable, allow, prevent, help, obstruct. We talk about succeeding and failing and ability and difficulty. So here's the, the idea. We have a causal complex that brings about a uh, effect, <coughs> effect. And the two key properties of the uh, causal complex are that when everything in the uh, causal complex happens or holds, then the effect happens, and all the event, all the eventualities in the causal complex are relevant in a, in a way that can be made precise. So here's an example. If we um, suppose I have this arrangement of switches and a light bulb, and uh, sometimes in some settings of the switches it comes on, and other settings it's off. If there's some uh, switch here. Where it doesn't matter whatever, what, what other, how other, how the other switches are toggled, no matter what I do, uh, this switch will never cause E to go on or go off. If that's the case, then this is not in the causal complex. So that's what I mean by kind of the relevance of the eventuality. And then the cause is uh, when we distinguish a, a particular event within the causal complex. So if I stick my finger in a uh, socket and I get an electrical shock. Um, but that's only if the power is on, but we presume the power to be on. And now, of course, what, it's very context dependent what, uh, what we can presume to be true. I mean, I, I may think that I turn the uh, power off, and then I stick my finger in the socket, and I get a shock. 
well, in that case, why did you get a shock? Well, the cause was, you know, I had something wrong. I didn't really turn the power off. So they're, they're context dependent. Um, and in general, our knowledge of the world is, uh, is not in terms of causal complexes, as uh, they'd be too long. I mean, I have no idea all, all the things that have to be true in order for the light to actually come on. Uh, generally, we uh, know about uh, causes, that uh, if P happens, uh, then generally Q will happen, and P will cause Q. Uh, then I also know some kind of diagnostic facts about, well, I know that the, uh, the light bulb not being burned out is part of the causal complex for uh, the light coming on. But I, again, I can't spell out the whole causal complex. Uh, skip over time and the structure, more complex structural events. Uh, for more detail, you can go to my website, uh, Google Jerry Hobbs, ignore the um, man who murdered his daughter, and, uh, and then uh, you'll, under research areas, you'll see including common sense knowledge in which, in which all of the uh, causal, in which all of the core theories are spelled out. All right, now I want to look at uh, defining some words in terms of the core theories. Um, <clears throat> so the uh, George Lakoff in uh, one of his books uh, came up with the idea of ra uh, radio categories. Uh, the idea here is uh, the relation among word senses is that uh, you start off with uh, some word sense, you modify the definition kind of incrementally and get to another uh, sense, you modify that incrementally and get to another sense, and things can go radially and you know you start from sense one again and get another sense. Now if uh, what we're doing is uh, characterizing the word senses by means of axioms, then um, uh, the way you get from uh, one word sense to uh, another word sense in, this, in these radio categories is by uh, these incremental changes in axioms, uh, by incrementally changing the axiom. So I might have this axiom that characterizes the word P and uh, the, the first word sense, and I change it by uh, changing this Q2 to Q3, and I, uh, I get another word sense. So let me give a concrete ish example. So um, uh, for at, uh, you know, I have the uh, sense of a, of a physical object being at another physical object. You know, the terminal is at the table. Um, I can go from there to an event being at a physical location. So the, uh, the concert was in the auditorium. Um, I can go from there to action directed towards he aimed the rifle at uh, his sister. Uh, I can get from, uh, from there to a text event at a text location, like the, um, the denouement is on page uh, 323. Uh, from here, I also get to an entity being at a location on a scale. So uh, the, as in the, uh, um, the uh, test scores, for example, uh, that kind of branches off to giving me at least at most uh, one example of a scale is time, so I can talk about an event being out of time, classes at 10 o'clock. I can talk about an event being at an event, a discussion at lunch, and, uh, and then I can specialize the at there to uh, a causal relation, so you get things like uh, I knew at a glance, or the glance causes me to know. Um, So now I want to look at some of the words, event words in WordNet, and how you go about trying to capture the word sense, the various word senses, and what they have in common, and what the relation among them is. Uh, so it turns out in WordNet there are 19 senses of the word have. Um, but they really fall into uh, three classes, which might be called super senses. The first class is. Uh, uh, which I call S1, is to be in relation to. 
uh, as in I have $20 or I have a postdoc in both senses. I mean, it may be that I'm functioning now as a postdoc in some uh, group or uh, I as a professor have hired a uh, postdoc. Both of those are, uh, he's in the relationship to. And uh, so we can, what we can say about each of these uh, word senses that are in this subcategory is that uh, this word sense is a specialization of this super sense. Then there are the word uh, senses that have to do with uh, come to be in a relationship to, that is change into the situation in which uh, you're in a relation to. So uh, he had a heart attack uh, generally means, uh, generally describes the event itself of having the heart attack rather than the, um, um, rather than, you know, kind of the possession being in some relation to the heart attack. Uh, similarly, she had a baby. Um, so this is the difference between uh, I have a son and my wife had a, had a baby. I have a son would be in this category. My wife had a baby uh, would be in this category. Uh, and then there's the cause to come to be in a relation to, like he had the car fixed or he, he is playing a causal role in the car getting fixed. And let's have a party where the uh, where the uh, where us the we uh, are playing are having a causal role. It's not just a party going to happen to us. It's a, we're going to play a causal role in in uh, bringing about this uh, party. Uh, the word lack is uh, kind of means not have, but it doesn't mean not have any of these senses. It's not have only in the super sense one. So. You can lack $20 and you can lack a postdoc, uh, but you can't lack a heart attack, meaning you didn't have a heart attack. And the, uh, we can line up the frame up uh, senses of the, uh, there's five of them if we have, um, and we can line those up axiomatically with the various word senses and super senses in, um, in, uh, from ordinate. All right, here's the word remove. Um, the basic meaning of remove is that if X removes Y from Z, then X causes there to be a change from the situation in which Y is at Z. And there's eight different uh, word net senses of remove. Um, the first of them is uh, where we specialize the at relation to physical location. Uh, the second one we specialize at to be a position in an organization. In the third one, Y is somehow dysfunctional, so we move the trash. Uh, the, this, uh, probably the most interesting, is where we uh, specialize at to be the, uh, the element of a set. So we remove, uh, we, had, we had four difficulties, but we removed one of them when we uh, fired somebody. Um, and then uh, there's a sense where the change is, uh, is somehow functional, uh, and, then, and then various other uh, senses that you can also get to by viewing them as specializations of this general pattern. And the frame net uh, senses are, uh, uh, there's two of them. The, the first sense is uh, simply this general sense. And the second sense is where we specialize X to a person, Y to clothes, and Z to the body. So, you know, I mean, re remove your shoes, for example. So what we have here is the uh, topological structure that's captured in this uh, super sense. Uh, then we have various specializations, the various word senses we get to by specializing um, by specializing uh, the, uh, the app predication in various ways, physical location or position and organization. And then also the ones we get to by adding domain constraints on arguments like the thing that you remove is trash or X is a person and Y is clothes. Uh, remain has four word net senses. Um, the, uh, the most general is the first, which means not change out of a state. Uh, so if X remains in state E1, then there's not a change from, this, from, uh, from E1, sorry, from E, 
uh, where X is uh, some plays some role or is is an argument of uh, of E, and then we can specialize this uh, where the app is uh, in uh, to physical location, as in he remained at his post, or the this is this the E is specialized to physical location. Uh, W3 is then um, where we specialize the uh, the E relation to be uh, in a set after the process of removal of other elements. So three problems remain. And then uh, W4 is a specialization of the, of the uh, physical location. Um, the various, so we, we can uh, define this uh, remain, uh, since W3x remains after process E, uh, as uh, E is a removal process in which Y removes a set of S2, a subset S2 from the set S1. S3 is the, sub, the, sub, the set difference between S1 and S2, and X is still a member of S3, so that's what it means for, uh, for X to remain after this uh, process. Um, the various nominalizations of remain are, well, remainder and remains. Uh, looking at uh, remainder, there are uh, four senses of the word remainder. Uh, one is the, just the general sense. They all depend on this sense of remain. That is, there's been a process of renewal. Um, I'm sorry, of removal. And um, the uh, and the first word sense is the, uh, the, the general remain. So X is the remainder after E if X remains after E. And then we specialize the E process uh, the removal as arithmetic division or arithmetic subtraction or the purposeful cutting of cloth uh, to get remainders. Um, so how am I doing on time? Which I, uh, guess. 10 minutes. I mean, I have a lot of examples and I don't want to go through all of them. Okay, we can finish a little bit earlier. No, the, no problem. Uh, the, um, let me just go through, uh, I'll go through difficult and then I'll go through uh, some of the others uh, more quickly. Um, so you can be difficult, so something can be difficult if it requires great physical or mental effort to accomplish or comprehend or endure a difficult task, difficult time, or difficult can be hard to control as in a difficult child. Uh, there are four senses of words, four senses of difficulty. <coughs> Uh, <coughs> the uh, noun, uh, it's an effort that's inconvenient, so he uh, had difficulty walking. Um, there's uh, difficulty as a factor causing trouble in achieving a positive result or tending to produce a negative result. Serious difficulties were encountered, and this is really, I think, the basic uh, definition. Uh, and then it's a condition almost beyond one's ability to deal with financial difficulties, and then uh, a kind of a measure or scale of difficultness. So they agreed on the, about the difficulty of the climb. They both said it was easy. So um, where it refers to the entire scale, the only the top part of which is uh, is uh, is actually difficult. Um, so. What we do is we characterize, first of all, that what it is for something uh, to be a difficulty is, uh, well, if, a, <clears throat> if E is a difficulty with for, a, uh, for an agent A, then, it, then A has some goal G, and there's some uh, condition, there's some negation of G, so if E1 is G not happening, and uh, this difficulty E tends to cause E1 not to happen. So this gives us the uh, kind of this core meaning of, uh, of difficulty sub two, and then difficulty sub four is the next place we want to go, and that's uh, it's a scale that subset consistent with the uh, set of difficulty sub two. That is, the more difficult the more difficulties you encounter, the greater the difficulty. The more difficulty sub two, the greater the difficulty sub four. And then uh, the other senses of difficulty and difficult can be defined in a straightforward way as uh, isolating different regions, generally the high region 
of the uh, difficulty scale. Um, so what we see, for example, is uh, is a change from uh, if I if x receives y from z, and there's a change from z having y to uh, uh, x having yeah to x having y. Um, the, uh, and then we get various specializations of that where the half is own or consume or property being true of something or ability to perceive or believe so receive a signal or receive wisdom. Uh, exchange is, uh, if x exchange is y with z, then uh, we have a change from x having y and w having z and, um, and x to the state in which x has z and y has w has it y this should be y um, and then various senses you get by specializing the uh, have uh, relation um, so this is this gives an illustration of how uh, we can uh, kind of move incrementally from one uh, sense to a basic sense to uh, further to uh, more specialized senses or maybe even less specialized senses. The basic meaning of hold is that x holds condition e1 to be true. So if uh, x holds e1, then x causes there not to be a change from state e1. And things that you can analyze in this terms, in these terms are uh, you know, hold it against the wall, hold the bowl, hold your temper, hold the fort, it holds three gallons. He held me to my promise. Uh, they are holding hostages. Then we can cut out various pieces of uh, this definition and get kind of reduced uh, senses. Uh, one is, well, if there's no change from E1, then E1 still holds. So what about just X causes E1? And uh, that covers senses uh, like uh, hold a reception or I hold reservations on today's flight. Another thing you can do here is uh, if x causes some eventuality, then that eventuality holds. So that means we can go from this x causes the not change from just to the not change from. And um, so the, this covers senses like he held my deposit, the weather held, the bridge held. He holds his liquor well. <coughs> and then if there's no change from E1, then E1 holds. So the hold can just be E1, as in she holds an, a PhD from MIT. She holds the governorship, this theory holds, I hold that the world is round, uh, where we've kind of lost the, both the causal and the change from uh, aspect of uh, the word. Uh, free uh, means, if, uh, basically the adjective free says, uh, X is free of constraints C to do E1. Uh, means that uh, it's not the case that C causes E1 not to occur, where X is some participant in E1. So uh, examples of that would be pull his arm free where, um, where the E1 is moving the arm. There's basically, you get them by specializing E1 to moving, using, and, and other things. And uh, capture, to capture something is, uh, is a uh, x captures y is a change to the situation in which x holds y or spelling it out more completely a change to the situation where x causes there to be no change from y being a z uh, release then is uh, if x releases y from z and uh, x causes there to be a change from uh, the situation in which x holds y at z, or we can uh, expand out the uh, hold. And then you again, the way I did with pre previously, you can uh, collapse this into various other super senses uh, by kind of applying inference rules to the various pieces of this. So I'll run a, do a couple of text and tail examples. I won't run through these in detail, but. But basically, suppose you read a sentence, uh, 
a Filipino hostage in Iraq was released. And he'd like to know, is it true or false that a hostage had been held captive in Iraq by captors? Um, how are you going to you know, figure that out? Well, from the axioms that I've presented, you can uh, decompose release uh, like this. Uh, and then if there's a change from the situation, uh, there must have been a change to the initial situation at some point, at least feasibly, that happened before that. And that's just a capture. And so that gives us the captive and the captor and the, uh, and the uh, holding as well. Another example from the same uh, Filipino hostage in Iraq was released. Is it true or false that the captors let the hostage go free? Well, here we have the, uh, the decomposition of release. Uh, the uh, decomposition of uh, let is not cause not. A go is just changed to free is this, and then you can see how all the pieces of release line up with the pieces of let go free. Um, okay, to summarize, uh, WordNet was developed in uh, the 1980s and since then, uh, encoding a very large lexical resource with precise hierarchical and other lexical relations like uh, synonymy but uh, very imprecise glosses. Uh, the glosses were written for people. Um, Harbaju and Moldovan created XWM, which was in which they automatically translated the glosses of WordNet into uh, axioms, uh, but with very, I think, uh, uneven results. Um, FrameNet developed from the uh, 90s on uh, it's a smaller, but it's a growing lexical resource. It's uh, more precise and gives somewhat deeper characterizations of the words in the, uh, formal, in the formal parts. And it's at least close to formalization if you uh, precisely formalized. It would be straightforward to do so. Uh, in this effort, while well, it's just beginning, it aims at uh, creating lexical, a lexical resource connecting words and, and uh, with axioms in formal logic and underlying core theories. Um, it's immediately computational since it is formal. Um, it's anchor and it's anchored in underlying uh, coherent abstract theories. So maybe I should call this something like infernet. Uh, the question we would have then is how far away are we from infernet? And what direction do we take to get there? Unfortunately, I found the answer to that as I was in, traveling in Nice two years ago. Um, that's the answer. So, please, <laughs> any more questions? Yes. Actually, uh, two related questions. So, first one. Uh, first one would be uh, whether uh, you deal, no, how, how do you deal with uh, vagueness? Whether you um, say implicitly interpret the, uh, the uh, propositions as in a prototypical way or. Yeah. And the so, other, maybe, maybe uh, I will think the, the, the other as well. So uh, whether one should uh, care about the size of what is defined by Sikon in terms of the number of the different predicates. <clears throat> What's the second part again? Uh, the, 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 the size of defining lexicon, if you want. So, so the, the number of pred different predicates that you use in the definitions in the axioms. Uh, okay, on the first vagueness, first of all, the, uh, the axioms uh, really are all defeasible. That is, yeah, so you have to have uh, some kind of a non monotonic logic for working on them. Uh, in, in which you uh, are trying to find uh, the best possible interpretation using these uh, axioms, and you have a measure of what's, what's better than another, and uh, you apply that to uh, choose the ones you get. Now, the, uh, the, the method of non-feasible reasoning or non-monotonic reasoning that I use is, uh, is abduction, a weighted abduction. And, um, and that, that gives you those properties, but there are other logics, of course. 
Um, and then uh, for the, the the other fact about the factor about vagueness is that uh, some things um, you just don't know. I mean, so is uh, is a man who's six foot three tall? Yes. Is a man who's six foot tall? Uh, maybe I'll just keep quiet about that and not say. So so uh, so that. Now, the number of predicates, I wasn't sure, again, I'm not sure what the issue is. Well, the, the relation between, between these sort of predicates would be, yeah, whether they are you know, atomic or... So, I mean... The, the number of, number of you, you should care about the number. Well, I mean, so all of this is based on developing, first of all, a uh, coherent theory of the underlying abstract phenomena like composite entities or scales or um, you know, change of state or causality. And um, when you do that, you're going to do it in a way that minimizes the number of predicates, um, or at least the number of core predicates, the number of predicates that really do the work. So you might have another, so I might have a predicate prevent that says cause not, uh, but the basic one is going to be cause, and that's what I'm going to be explicating. And then, um, the, uh, in, in constructing the axioms, defining the words, uh, what you need to do is simply anchor them in these, in these predicates. And so you're going to have a, a relatively manageable number of predicates at that point. Okay. So we said you've got 16 categories there. You split it, uh, core work into 16 yeah, categories. Yeah, about that, yeah. Um, You've got some unspecified formulas there for, for those formulas? Or? The, that, uh, the categorization is purely a uh, heuristic um, um, effort to... Um, so, say I want to set up, uh, do a, um, a theory of the micro-social world. The question is, well, what um, what concepts should be covered? I mean, that's that's the basic question. What do I need to axiomatize in it, and uh, what kinds of uh, definitions of words do I have to uh, uh, be able to support with the uh, with this underlying theory? Well, when I do this categorization of the microsocial world, I, I say, well, you know, I've got a lot of words that have to do with friends and enemies, a lot of words that have to do with helping other people. A lot of words that have to do with encounters with other people. A lot of words with uh, have to do with organizations. So I've got to I've got to talk about that tells me in my micro underlying microsocial theory. I have to um, develop the concept of uh, of a, one person being acquainted with another, one person being a friend of another or an enemy of another, one person helping another. Uh, a, a what it is to be a group of people having a common goal, uh, what it is for a person to be a leader of a group and to exercise the authority in that group. So what this categorization of words does is kind of force you to, um, to uh, identify those underlying concepts that need to be covered in uh, such a core theory and then uh, work as a, a function, a forcing function for, uh, for what needs to be developed in that core theory. Yeah, but uh, at that level, you've got no uh, formulas. Uh, you, you no, it's purely, mm -hmm. purely uh, heuristic. Mm -hmm. I just see the things. Okay. If, I, if I may uh, make a remark, uh, in the Balkan project, uh, there was uh, defined uh, a set of base concepts, which is bigger then this core board net, it now contains about 8,000 concepts. Mm -hmm. So maybe uh, they are now they are marked in Princeton board net. <coughs> you can mm -hmm. see that immediately, mm -hmm. no problem. And um, the second point is a question. As far as I could see, you didn't use uh, throughout the whole lecture uh, uh, expression ontology. Why? <laughs> Uh, yeah, the question is, uh, what, is a, what does ontology mean to me? An ontology is a logical theory. So, so uh, you know, it's a set, of, a set of predicates and a set of corresponding axioms that constrain the, 
interpretations of the predicates. And um, so, yeah, I mean, anytime I say core theory, I could have said ontology. Okay, that's, thank you. Yes, please. Uh, it seems to me that there's been a lot of similar work in the past. A lot of work on lexical decomposition in yes, uh, linguistics, and uh, of course in AI is Shank and uh, the sort of work on formalizing common sense knowledge as well, you know, CYC, by that and all this stuff. You, you haven't mentioned that. Could you uh, tell us what the relation of your work to this previous work is? Well, and the, you uh, on that where you the, the yeah, the <coughs> work on um, uh, the uh, lexical uh, decomposition in uh, linguistics. Uh, has, has been very influential, obviously, in, uh, in what I'm doing here. I think the mistake, well, I mean, most of that was done in the uh, late 60s and early 70s among the generative semanticists. And the mistake they made was trying to do it in the view it as transformations rather than viewing it as, uh, as axioms and uh, logical theory. Um, but, you know, I, and also they, they lacked uh, an adequate notion of defeasibility so that, uh, you know, when somebody raised the example of, well, you can kill a person figuratively without them being literally dead, and that kind of torpedoed the whole enterprise. Um, <clears throat> the, um, so, I mean, you have to embed it all in, in the right sort of framework. Um, on site, so what I'm trying to do is write the first 10,000 axioms the knowledge base. And what they did was start with axiom 10,001. Um, that makes sense. I mean, they, they don't have, they, they, I mean, here's another way to put it, right? The top level distinction that you make in psych is between tangible and intangible. And language doesn't care about that. And the whole effort here was, I mean, I never talked about something, well, this has to be tangible. I mean, those are things that happen in the, uh, in the specializations of the topological structure. Uh, but they don't play any crucial role in the, in the, in the abstract theories. And when you, when you enforce a distinction between tangible and intangible at the top level, you thereby make all the rest of your work irrelevant for language. I was surprised to see that uh, you, uh, your basic definition of all is something, I can't tell you what it is, but it is not this. And I would say that the whole basically is like holy pencil, yeah. etc. Yeah, so, so in general, the, I mean, a very common argument is uh, that, that we have these uh, spatial and human action metaphors that uh, that are, are basic, and then what we do is we, um, we kind of loosen these and take metaphorical interpretation of these. Well, when you're taking a metaphorical interpretation, what are you doing? You're looking for some common property between this physical thing and this abstract thing. And what, are, what is that common property? Well, that common property in the case of Bohr is cause not to change from a state, all right? And so what I'm doing in the abstract theories is not looking at the, uh, so the idea is you've got the, the physical, the, the abstract, and the, uh, the uh, say, the, the physical, the metaphorical, and the abstract property that underlies the metaphorical. And what I'm doing is axiomatizing these abstract properties that can then be viewed, where we can then view both the physical and the metaphorical as instantiations of the abstract, rather than kind of going that. I mean, it's just a matter of directionality. Yes, please. Uh, thank you. I want to ask uh, the following thing about this question word net, and we are also working on word net and looking for similarity of words. And then you start with a word, you go to the next synonym, you go to the next synonym, and then counting the, the hops is the distance between the words. But uh, you mentioned also you can uh, consider subsets, for example, the most frequent words. But then you need a sort of mapping of word that to this special limited set to have any idea how to do this. Well, it sounds to me like for the, the problem that you're working on, you don't want to work on core word net. 
we want to work with the full word now. Um, by contrast, I, <coughs> I have to work with the, uh, the core word net because the whole word net is too big and I'm uh, doing manual effort. Um, I mean, this, this question of you know how many hops does it take to get from one word to another is an interesting one, but I, um, I think it's a very different problem than the one I'm looking at. Yeah, what is the issue of uh, language dependency? I'm sorry? The issue of language dependency. Does that play a role? Or is it... Uh, you mean like, that's something like English versus Czech? Uh, well, uh, in your examples, you have... I had a uh, my, my wife has a baby. Mm -hmm. I have some. These are very uh, linguistic interpretations. Right. Of meanings. So yeah. to what extent can, can... Do you want to avoid that kind of language dependency in... No, I mean, what I'm trying to do is, is take, take the facts of the language as expressed, as captured in, in WordNet. And I could have done it with any other word dictionary, or I could have, you know, started, you know, come de novo trying to figure out what the different senses <coughs> are. And uh, characterize them in terms of these underlying theories that are language independent, but inspired by language. Thank you, thanks. So thank you, Hans Moore.